how you doing everybody for this part of the Enchanted World series we're going to cover water spirits with a wonderful picture of mermaid by JW Waterhouse you know and uh, let's go along and see what I have let's start with the first um, illustrations you see uh, you know just a huge waves of ocean come by and then of course the next one shows dolphins going back two pages but in the third page we start to see, you know, not necessarily the mermaids, but um, some sort of half humanoid, uh, sort of like a half hippocampus with a humanoid body on it. Uh, sort of sea nymphs on dolphins, you know, some on the spears. Of course, if we go to the back, you know, you see them just going away. But this book covers all the type, uh, all the different um, legends and lures involving the oceans and what was out there. And here we got a wonderful John Howe picture right here. Yes, the same John Howe who did a lot of the um, conceptual art for the Lord of the Rings movies and The Hobbit. You know, just a wonderful fantasy artist. See a man carrying up, you know, despite, you know, a mermaid, despite the fact that there's a dog trying to pull him back. And uh, let's see. Uh, see. Then we got this picture right here. Let me adjust this so we get a good view. All right. And uh, the caption on the upper other page here: "Beautiful and terrible when a creature of the sea, you know, were the creatures of the sea, as a Cornishman found when he saved a mermaid, she rewarded him with the magical powers for a while. Then she took him to uh, from his place to dwell forever in the, in the depths." <laughs> Usually, like fairy tales, you know, a lot of the ocean stuff was um, kind of gave a warning: things are not as great as what they may seem. Oh, let's see. Ah, here we go. A couple of people looking at a reflection. Of course, a reflection is not um, of themselves. Capture reads, From water, goodness sprang. Somewhere in the world, it was said, there bubbled a spring that restored youth to the age and vigor, uh, 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 to the age and vigor to the frail. On its surface, old men and women saw themselves again as they have once have been. <laughs> All right. Uh, wonderful two-page deal. I'm not sure this is John Howe. It looks similar to his. You know, crashing, you know, huge um, upturned waters and storms and a bunch of people that you can see very closely on the top here, you know, and all of a side. Um, Capture on the bottom. Water could bring death as well as life as mortals knew too well. In a time before history, divine wrath unleashed a raging flood that drowned the entire world. The um, <laughs> Noachian flood. <laughs> Of course, um, familiar with fantasy role-playing games or of the, of the kind, you might see where these derived off later. Oh, uh, the water horse. Of course, um, um, there's a little thing on top here. I'll read that. The maritime mirror world. According to some say, just the, for the formation of the world was wrought with such perfect symmetry that every creature living on land had a counterpart in the sea. The mirror image of mortal men and women were mermen and mermaids who ruled under underwater kingdoms. And these kingdoms seemed with a wonderful menagerie. The Swedish naturalist Olas Magnus described the fish-tailed horses and you know that range the oceans from Brittany to Norway. He also spoke of dogfish that attack and devour human swim human swimmers. And the Roman historian Alien reported that the seas um, surrounded the island of Tabrabana, um later called um Sel um Ceylon. Um or or Kalon, you know, if it's you know with a hard C there, provide watery pastures for ram-headed fishes and forests of for um sca for scaly swimming lions, sea elephants, and other exotic mar uh, marine mammals. So you got the the water horse, and then you got the sea dog. And many you want these as pets? <laughs> Don't lie. Or perhaps you want some more the lion of the deep. <laughs> Or the oceanic elephant. <laughs> Interesting imagination these people had. And here we go. A man looking out in a cave into the you know, into the ocean. In search of the secret of immortality, Sismarian warrior King Gilgamesh journeyed through dark caverns of the edge of the edge, to the edge of the sea. Sorry, offshore shimmered an island. The home of a sage who knew how to elude death's clutches. Yeah, of course, you're looking a very, 
you know, hard to tell with the glare, but there's an island right there they're talking about. Of course, you find Gilgamesh again, the water. A pool lay deep in the ocean floor, an enchanted water within water. Here grew a flower that preserved human life, and Gilgamesh dived to pluck it out. Yes, that's Gilgamesh, not uh, Jason Momoa in the new Aquaman movie. <laughs> now here, it looks like there's um next few pages will be part of an overall story. But um, I'm not going to read the very story itself, due to lack of time, but I will read the captions on the bottom. So let me see if we get a good view of the picture here. Looks like a party's going on. The capture reads, Sailors drowned by the sea goddess of the north um, paid her a tribute of gold, so that their ghost might feast um, in her underwater hall. In the depths, the gold gleamed with light, thus it, it was called by the Norse the flame of the sea. Hmm. Be an after good after light and where you die. So, And here we got, um, looks like a spirit with a net um, coming out of the water and over a few wrecked ships here. Um, yeah, and again, I, I constantly apologize for the glare, but that's just the way my lighting is. But let's see what it shows here. Um, let's see, picture put it right here. I'll read the caption: Out of the depths, the goddess Ran would would rise, casting her net wide over ships, mast and sail. Caught, you know, caught in a mighty web, unfortunate voyagers looked their uh, looked their last on life and clutched the gold that would aid their ghosts to the watery under, under to the watery underworld here we got the same um, water you know sea goddess here you know going against them um, um, going across the oceans and looking upon a town let's see what it says about this I'll pick, put position this right here the people of Norse coast knew when the sea goddess had embraced their kin on winter nights the race uh, of those who had drowned would trail across the beaches of their settlements and drink the ale from the mid, mid, midwinter feast. Hmm. And here we have a um, picture of Norsemen on a ship. Of course, the most interesting part is right here of a guy on the edge here. Text you know, positions this. Um, here we go. To appease the voracious hunger of the sea, Norsemen made sacrificial offerings. Of the captives um, from their raids, one man in ten was sent to the deep to feed the goddess Ran, and it was hoped to ensure safe passage for the rest. <laughs> ah, chapter 2. Now this particular chapter is interesting because it talks about the, um, the um, Odyssey of Homer's fame. So it looks like, um, yep, they're getting ready to go. And I always found this interesting because um, if you look closely in this picture, there's a centaur and a giant on this um, side here. Let's see. Oh, that's, yeah, cent yeah, centaur Kiron. And let's see. Oh, wait, but this is not, okay, this, oh, this is not, this is, um, from looks at his text here, sorry, something about Jason, as in Jason the Argonaut, so he goes um, on his sailing voyage as well. I think this chapter covers both. You know, talk about the Greekness of the ocean. Uh, here we go. Um, interesting picture here. Let's see. The Greek heroes who sailed with Jason in the Argo counted on magic and divine aid to avert the perils of the sea. The ship bore painted eyes um, upon her bow to spy out enemies. At her prow reared an oak branch to yield the spirit of the goddess Athena. Let's see. You know, not too much knowing about Greek you know, letters, but I do think that actually spells out Argo. Because I recognize the alpha and the rho, which rho looks like a P. That's Omega. So I think that's um, probably Gamma there. Argo. Hmm. Uh, no one another ship going across the oceans. As I think it's the Clashing Rocks. Um, awaiting Jason the Argonauts at the gateway of the Black Sea were the rock giants known as the um, Symblegades. A pair of granitic monsters forming a maw that would crush any ship to splinters. Of course, if you're familiar with the old classic movie of Jason the Argonauts, it's just a clashing rocks. But, you know, I kind of like this version better. Moving on. Oh, this is a wonderful picture. And probably, you know, some of you might know of um, the Last Unicorn film based on Pierre S. Bagel's book. Yeah, it was 
or even Lord of the Rings. Lashing the great white mares of the waves, the god of the horses and lord of the ocean, dro um, drove the swells of the, uh, in a golden chariot. Poseidon was the sea king's name. Yep, Poseidon and his horses. Kind of weird for the lord of the ocean would ha have the horses as a symbol. Of course, also what you, you know, may not realize is that he was also the god of earthquakes. <laughs> Here we go. Ah. Now here we're going to with the um, with the, um, the Odyssey. Um, this is a scene here, and um, we got beautiful ocean maidens uh, um, go, uh, climbing up aboard a ship. You may know the scene. Let me read chap the caption: Sea nymphs singing songs that drove men mad with longing sought to draw the adventurer Odysseus in into their deadly embrace. They were the sirens, a name that meant entanglers. Oh, sorry about that. But if you have any questions on who did the artwork, let me know. I'll try and um, look up at a page, and you can probably find it yourself. Because a lot of these are uh, from um, classics or e and to up to modern stuff. This I always found neat. <laughs> um, Once lovely Skyla, made into a six-headed man-eating man-eater by enchantment, layered in coastal caves, hungry for seafarers. Those who escaped her jaws risk being devoured by her partner, the whirling sea mouse um, Charibus. Uh, Charib Charibdis. Man, I always love that one. You know, this picture. Go more text here. Uh, here we got uh, Odysseus. Let me, get, let me try and get a good view. You know, looks like the um, goddess here. But let's see if I can position them both. Read the caption. Cast into the waves with a, when a wrathful, Pose wrathful Poseidon shattered his ship, Odysseus re um, received unexpected aid from another divinity of the sea. Leucothea, the white goddess, rose from the waters and offered him the shelter of her of her enchanted veil. Isn't that nice of her? <laughs> ah. Here we got the looks of the Odysseus' ship with the um, it looks like a goddess and you know formed out of the clouds. When Odysseus eluded him, Poseidon visited a cruel punishment on the sailors who had carried the adventurer beyond his grasp. He turned them and their ship to stone. <laughs> Now we got the second, you know, we got another one of the in-between type stories here. Again, the wonderful John Howell did all the illustrations in this section. These are talking about the um, predators from the primal world. Yeah, I'll read. I'll read these. Um, seafarers sought to master the ocean and drive away its spirits, but powerful survivors of the first age of, of creation long lurked on empty shores and in the in the deeps. Immeasurably old, filled with wrath, these beasts became the stuff of seamen's let seamen's let tales. Thus, North North ha, sorry, I can't read right now. Thus, northern mariners sang of, of serpents layering in icy caves, scanning for ships with keen eyes. Such a creature's attack was swift and silent. Before they died, its victims saw only a ripple of the waters, a swaying head above a mass, and a gaping mouth eager for flesh. Giant fish. If you're seeing this, you probably think of either Pinocchio or I think think Baron Munchausen, the Terry Gilliam film. You know, ship on the side. I'll focus on this and read the section. The Pelagic Scavenger. When they spoke of monsters, ancient chroniclers named uh, ancient chroniclers named Tiburon. Ah, I'm not reading this right. When they spoke of monsters, ancient chronic um, chroniclers named Tiburon. It had um. It had a sh um, sh ugh, sorry, it had a shark's teeth, sharp as scimitars, but no shark could match its size. The largest of small frigate, it, you know, it swallowed it in its wake of sailing ships far from land, and left no hope for seamen swept overboard. No lion could save those helpless men. Tiburon fed on them, and his belly became their grave. Uh, here we go. This one always scared me as a kid, just the fact that something, you know, something like this can, you know, this can happen to you and the scale of it. 
a spinner of maelstroms. Woe to the seafarers who beheld Leviathan, a creature so vast that it dwarfed the largest whale. It kept for the most part of the valley of the ocean floor. When hunger um, brought it to the surface, however, sailors were lost, the story is said. Its lashing fins and tail um, created maelstroms that sucked whole ships down to its cold and sunless realm. A uh, bunch of sailors attacking a giant octopus. Let's see if I can position this in a, in a way to where I'll... A tentacle invader. Almost suddenly, always stealthily, the devilfish invaded the very hearts of sailing ships with slippery and many suckled tentacles. Through hatchways and portholes, the octopoid arms uh, would slide, searching for out flesh for the devilfish to feed on. It killed, by it killed by crushing, axes and knives, um, severed tentacles, but each attack dragged a few luckless seamen from the safety of their vessels. Uh, no caption here, but a very interesting image of spirits um, dancing around the ocean. Race of, of the wind and, wa and wave. All right, just a second here. A bunch of undead peering out from into the ocean. Or it looks about a bunch of drowned sailors here. Um, let's see. You see, they're still in the water. You can see the fish. Get a good one here. Catcher reads Rooted to the ocean floor, never sleeping, never free. Drowned sailors rocked in the current. Um, their bodies prey to sea creatures. Their souls haunted the surface and begging for ease. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Uh, let's see. Interesting picture. Giant ghost, or um, something with a, a very gaunt skeletal face on the you know, on the rigging here. Uh, let's see. The ghosts of sailors drowned in the deep might appear on passing ships, clinging to the shrouds and cl clutching at the yard arms. The sight of, of them brought terror, for they came to call the living to watery graves. Woman out in the water, there was lantern. No footsteps were left by the women who walked on the Cornish coast by night. She was a ghost, tormented by grief, eternally searching for an infant who had died offshore. Let's see, moving on. And this is interesting. You got one person clinging to a main mast here. A fiery portent. Before storms at sea, when the air brimmed with electricity, um, Spirit fires played um, in the rigging of sailing ships, flying from mast to mast and top of the, no, top to top. And sailors saw um, saw in them portents of the future. They said that if only one light leaped in the rigging, the ship was heading towards stormy deaths. If two shone, the winds would lull the, uh, and the seas quiet. Or they said that descending flames meant disaster, and descending ones fair weather. Some sailors thought the lights um, were ghosts of old comrades come to warn of perils. All believed that if the lights played on a living man's head, that man was doomed. So familiar was this phenomenon that sailors gave its name. They gave it gave it names. Some called the lights Saint Elmo's fire, the name being a corruption of Erasmus. The um, Syrian um, patron um, saint of sailors. The Greeks named it a Dioscuri for the Argonaut twin Castor and Polydeuces, who um, guarded the souls of seafaring men after death. And the Portuguese called the lights um, corpuscents or bodies of saints, believing that they were spirits of the blessed. Ah, a Japanese one. Let me put this right here. It looks like. Some watery spirits are going against a ship. Let's see what it says. Centuries ago, the warriors of the Minamoto family fought the ruling clan of the Tiara in the strait that guided, um, guarded Japan's inland sea. The Tiara lost all earthly power there, staying in waves of blood, but their ghosts still haunted the living um, on nearby shores. Hmm. Let's see, moving on. We're over halfway through this book here. Uh, guy, you know, looming over on a ship of heavy waves and a ghost coming up, and you know, from the ocean. Uh, let's see. 
Across the sea, one night came a Cornish murderess, Sarah Polgrain, a shade pursuing with cold eyes and arms the sailor whose lover she had been in life. A lot of Cornish myths about, you know, of the ocean. Now this was kind of hard to see here because um, you can definitely see the ship right here, but in the background, almost as light um, as, you know, the clouds in the background is another sailing ship. And the caption reads, this was a sight to chill a seaman's heart, the flying Dutchman speeding before her own ghost wind and crew by a company of the dead. She argued death um, to those who spied her. Or argued death to those who spied her. <laughs> Not argued. Very nice dramatic picture here. Um, forever lashed by wind and rain, forever braced on his rolling deck, the spectral captain, the flying Dutchman, sailed his ship wherever sea roads led. Uh, rendezvous with the um, with the death of the ship. Uh, oh. yeah, this is going to take a few pages. Probably too long to read all at once. Um, so I'll just show off the illustrations. You see, a couple of people looks like they're marooned off a um, um uh, you know, or not marooned, but they were apparently um taken off from a vessel. Quickly looking at this, looks like um Spaniards, um. Um, and it looks like coming from the Caribbean. Mm. Very atmospheric picture here. So I don't know what the story's about, but I have to skip one of these on occasion. Oh. Looks like a sword fight's happening. But if this draws your interest, yes. Please go to Amazon or check your local um, used bookstores and see if they have a copy. Hmm. A picture here of a, of a young, beautiful woman coming out of a um, look side of a well, intriguing a young man. Perilous borderland. Hmm. Doesn't tell the caption, so the next page might tell. Uh, here we go. Let's see. When they chose to take human form, the, spirit, the spirits of wells and pools were infinitely enticing to mortals. But their sweet embrace was a route to ruin. <laughs> now I remember reading this story <clears throat> when back when I was in middle school. You know. Yeah, this is a Japanese story. Uh, through the grace of water magic, the fishermen... Urashima feasted with the sea lord's daughter in a tea house on, on the ocean floor. Yes, he's brought into this world and enjoyed his wonders, and he later he in he fights a um, water scorpion, which he was able to defeat with an arrow, um, poisoned by his own um, spit. Actually, so water from a man's mouth is poison to it. The fisherman Urashima left the palace of the sea lord to return to his own village. A giant turtle was his steed, but he found that his home was home no more. Yeah, he came back, but the time was much, much later. He, you know, he had children who were grown up and all that. Here we go. A couple of people looking off the sh looking up from the shore. Well, at least one's looking, you know, under shore. One seems to be coming out. In Scotland, it was said that maidens sometimes summon selkie lovers to the shore by weeping into the water. The Selkies walked on land as men and gave the women children. Then they vanished into the sea as seals, leaving the mothers bereft. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> and here we got a very interesting you know, picture here. A guy with a sword raised up, hand on his head, and looks like um, a water nymph. Let's see, yeah, let me read just this. With a shriek of triumphant laughter and a flash of scales, a water nymph div, um, died out of the reach of a young cabal of Scotland, the man she would murder with magic. <laughs> of course, the text on the side here would all um, will probably give a lot more detail than that, so. I think it uses interesting previews. <laughs> there we go. Looks like Jay Waterhouse, um, J.W. Waterhouse painting again, like on the cover. Only the foolhardy lay down 
<clears throat> excuse me, only the foolhardy lay down to rest near the banks of, or brooks at, and the borders of springs. Solitary nymphs guarded the waters, and a sleeper might awaken to the sight of beauty that would lure him to his doom. Here's an interesting one. Battling a fountain's deadly garden. Not all spirits of the world's fresh waters took human shape. Near Lerna, at the eastern coast of Greece, layered the Hydra, a beast with a multitude of serpentine heads. One of them, one of, one of them immortal, and a, a breath so venomous that it could kill the living. It haunt. It, its haunt is a fathomless um, Lernian swamp, where the monstrous crab kept, um, kept a company. But Hydra also ranged a fertile dis, um, um, dis, district um, around the marsh, terrorizing all who dwell there. The hero Hercules challenged the Hydra once, in the course of his adventures. With his charioteer beside him, he forced the water monster from its lair by pelting it with a burning uh, with burning arrows. In rage, it rushed at him and coiled around his legs, its head withering as it sought for a strike. At it, at his feet, it, you know its its companion cra um, crab plucked you know, with enormous pincers. Hercules crushed a crab with his foot. Um, with his club, he battered the hydra's head, and his charioteer seared the stumps with burnt, burning brands. For new heads grew when the beast's blood um, spurted. When Hercules um, severed the head that was immortal and buried it deep, muffling the hissing that never stopped, he dipped his arrows in the gall from his body of the hydra. From that time forward, the hero, hero's arrows, a venom. Um, Oh, sorry. Envenomed by the water monster, never failed to kill. You hear similar stories like that. You watch Jason, no, sorry, you watch Clash of the Titans. The blood of Medusa was poisonous and stuff like that. It's a very interesting picture. Normally you don't see that underwater. A um, couple of people swimming um, near the surface, and it looks like an entire European town underwater here. And the caption reads, In the depths of a lake in Switzerland lay an entire living town tra transported there by the water nicks so that she could stay forever with her mortal lover. So many people may think that's selfish, but... <laughs> uh, here we go. This was a very kind of haunt, you know, scary picture there of the old man with corals coming out of his arms. And two mermaids looking over it. This was a fate of the men and women whom the water took away, to lie forever un unburied in the deep, in the deep, prey to fish and home to coral, gaze upon by the indifferent eyes of drifting water nymphs. Again, I won't read this full story here. Um, a Doom Alliance of Earth and Water. Now, I think I've seen that picture on the cover of a fantasy um, novel, with also the interior ones. I wonder if they're related. At least, at least know something similar. Hmm. Challenged by a pretty woman, the knight um, Holdbrand dared the terrors of a, of a haunted wood. Let's see. Moving on. Here we go. Uh, Let's see, an unsettled creature born of wind and waves, the sea maiden Undyne waited for one to love her. There we go. Sheltering on an island in the midst of the flood, the knight and the sea maiden pledged their love. Undyne rode to the, um, to the world of mortals with two guides, a human priest and a spirit of the waters. Looks like the spirit of the waters has his cloak, you know, turned into waves here while the priest itself looks like an ordinary priest carrying a cross. Let's see, uh, here we go. In Holbrun's world, a rival wait, uh, waited Undyne, the Lady Bertalda, who, who herself desired the knight. Let's see, cast aside by the faithless Holbrun, the sea bandit sank to the water and that had formed her. <laughs> 
In Holborn's dreams, Undyne shimmered, singing sadly, in a crystal palace beneath the sea. So I see parallels that with a little mermaid. And there you have it. That's the end of this book. Um, hope you all enjoyed it. And you all have a nice day. Again, if you have any questions about the pictures or who painted them, uh, I could quickly answer that. Um, just tell me which part, what time in the book here, and, who, and ask who did it, and I could quickly find out for you. Thank you very much. You all have a nice day. That is Water Spirits.